But he like totally turned around because he's like, this is like so weird. And he saw behind him on a bench was something that looked like a red rag. So he went closer to investigate and he saw that it wasn't really a red rag, but it was a red silk jacket. And in the red silk jacket was a newborn baby, like a couple of hours old. The umbilical cord was still attached. There was still that newborn film. And attached to the jacket was a note that said, may whoever find this baby, may health, happiness, and fortune find your way. Mm. So that baby was me. And Twist. my father, yep. <laughs> the Goldsteins saw a little Chinese baby by herself, left with no one there. They had a choice. Leave her and let the Chinese government take her or adopt her and change her life and the Jewish lives forever. This is the story how one act changed generations. This episode is in memory of Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe and Shimon David Ben Shlaim Yaakov. This episode is powered by Bitbean, the top software company in the world. Twillery, the makers of the coolest, pun intended, clothing, paid the ultimate way to cash in on your points. And of course, Ches Chicago, the best way to help Chicago people in need and win a Tesla. Here we go. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, long time planning this. Very long time. Mrs. Devorah Goldstein, thank you so much for being here. A lot to ask you, but could you take us back to, before you could remember, where you're from and kind of how you got to here? Here in the studio. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, my father wrote the book, The Bamboo Cradle, and um, my father and my mother were, they had met each other. They're both not from, they both came from families that knew nothing about Yiddishkeit. My mother actually came from a family where her mother came from a family um, that was actually from. So we have a whole side of the family now that's, you know, it's nice to have these cousins that are from. And But my mother herself grew up in a home that knew nothing about Yiddishkeit and my father as well. So they met each other in college and they got married and my father was a sociologist, not a psychologist, but a sociologist. That's somebody that studies the customs of people, the customs of different cultures. Um, and so they did a lot of traveling and they were all over the place studying different cultures and why people do certain things. And uh, they had been married for quite a while, about probably six or seven years, and they still had not been able to start a family yet. And they went to doctors and they were told everything's fine. It's not a problem. They wanted to adopt a child, but they only wanted to adopt really like a baby, um, somebody that would only know them as their parents. And apparently there was a very long list for that. So they put their name on the list. And then my father received a very prestigious award called the Fulbright Scholarship, which is given to various professors across the world. And well, I'm going to interrupt. They specifically wanted to adopt a child. They Well, at that point when they, she, my mother saw she wasn't getting pregnant mm -hmm. um, and she wanted a family. So mm -hmm. the next step was, okay, if, you know, I'm not getting pregnant, then let's go and adopt a child. Got it. But they, they were very picky. They wanted a baby, you know, or a young toddler. Um, mm -hmm. And as we know, unfortunately, most of the children that are up for adoption are really older children in, you know, foster care. So they didn't want that. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So go back. So your father got this award? Award, right. Um, so it's basically where a professor from one country is invited to go teach for the year in another country. Mm -hmm. And so he was invited to Taiwan to be a visiting professor in the University of Taiwan. So they decided it was like the perfect time because why not? You know, they're at this stage in their lives. My mother was studying for her uh, master's in education. And so off they went. And he went to go teach in the University of Taiwan. And it was a morning in May. It was one of those beautiful, very rare mornings, you know, where the air is fresh and the sky is blue. And, and there were many ways to get to work that day. And he decided that he would walk to the train station and take the train as opposed to taking the bus or a cab. So he was staying by the train station very early, probably about 6 a.m., waiting for the train to come, reading his paper. No one was really on the platform. And he heard what sounded like a baby's cry. So, you know, not unusual. It's a train station. You know, so he turns around, he looks, he doesn't see anything. He's like, all right, goes back to his newspaper. And he hears the sound again. So he turns around, looks around again, doesn't see anything. The third time he's like, it's for sure a cat. You know how cats can sometimes sound like really human? But he like totally turned around because he's like, this is like so weird. And he saw behind him on a bench was something that looked like a red rag. So he went closer to investigate and he saw that it wasn't really a red rag, but it was a red silk jacket. And in the red silk jacket was a newborn baby, like a couple of hours old. The umbilical cord was still attached. There was still that newborn film. And attached to the jacket was a note that said, may whoever find this baby, may health, happiness, and fortune find your way. Mm. So that baby was me. 
And Twist. my father, yep. <laughs> and my father would always say, like, well, the health came and the happiness came, but he's still waiting for like that fortune to like arrive <laughs> at the door. Um, no, Baruch Hashem, we're very blessed. But um, so he picked me up and, you know, being a man, no offense, didn't really know what to do with a newborn baby. Yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> um, and so he called over the transit police, gave me over to the transit police. His train came and off he went. So when he got to work, we, you know, when I tell people the story, I'm like, you have to remember, this is the days before cell phones, before news can fly so fast that, you know, people in Eretz could hear something that happened on your block before you even hear right. it, you know? Um, and so it was, the, it was the days of pay phones. And so he would call my mother usually every day around 10 o'clock just to check in, see how her day was going. And um, that day, obviously, his phone call was a little different. Hmm. And my mom was like you know, hello, we've been waiting for a baby. Like, where's the baby? And my, I was like, I don't know, what am I supposed to do with the baby? I gave the baby to the police. And, you know, my mother was like, didn't you ever hear finders keepers? Like, yeah. hello, like you found a baby. Let's go track her down. Like, maybe we can adopt her and bring her back. So my father, being a very wise man, canceled his classes the rest of the day, met my mom by the train station. And the, you know, transit police were like, well, what do you think we're going to do with a baby? We, we don't have the baby. They sent the baby down, block to a church run by a man called Reverend Wu. So they tell my parents, go down there and track the baby there. So they went down there and, um, you know, they knocked on the door and they said that they were there. My father said, I'm the man that found the newborn baby that was brought to you today. We, we'd like to see her. We'd like to. So they brought my parents in and the reverend sat them down and he started to sort of say, well, you know, after my parents expressed their um, interest in adopting me, he was like, well, I don't know. You know, you're Americans and you're going back to America. And this is a Chinese baby. I don't feel like it's like, you know, responsible of me. And my father, don't forget, was, you know, um, a sociologist. He knew how to read people very well. And he pulled <laughs> my mother aside and he was like, okay, I don't think he really cares. <laughs> I yeah. think he wants to know, like, let's talk tachlis. Like, you know, how much are we willing to offer? Hmm. And so he told my mother to open up, you know, her wallet. And she had 25 US dollars. And so he went back and he told the reverend, um, I'm going to pay you $100 for the baby. We promise we'll tell her all about her Chinese heritage. I'm going to give you $25 as a deposit. And we'll come back with the rest of the 75. So like I always tell people because I could see the look like, huh? Like you can't even walk into Target and walk out and spend, you know what I mean? Like yeah. like a hundred dollars, like this couple like <laughs> wanted a baby so badly and they offered like, what's a hundred dollars, right. you know? And so I always remind people it was 1972. Right. And oh, inflation, that's a million oh, yeah, dollars right? or something. The dollar in China was very high. Right. A hundred dollars is a lot of money. Right. I just have to say for my own cover. Yeah, because yeah, like yeah, yeah. I can see people being like, oh, "Wow, <laughs> she's worth a hundred dollars." You know, like that's nothing. Um, and Reverend Wudu was like thrilled. He goes, "Okay, great." And he hands the baby over to my parents, wow. and they walked out. You know, my mother always says most people have nine months to prepare for a baby. Sometimes, you know, less, but usually you have a couple of you know months at least to know that a baby's coming. She's like, she woke up that morning childless, and like walked out with a baby. So um, she had a housekeeper, whose name was Mamie. She had nine children of her own. Hmm. And um, she got my mother the cloth diapers and the bottles and the, and um, yeah. And my mother always says that, like, you know, she obviously grew up in, you know, like in, when we're from, we grow up surrounded with babies and children. And, you know, we raise our kids to babysit and, you know, we have cousins. And my mother was like not really surrounded by any of that. So hmm. she said she really didn't know how to deal with like this newborn baby. And she said, if anybody would have told her that this tiny little human being would be able to keep a grown adult up <laughs> all night, she would have been like, no, there's no way. I'm the adult. This is a child, <laughs> you know. Um, but she said, nope, I kept her up all night. Um, and if you look at pictures, you see in the morning, like, you know, her eyes are like half shut. She's exhausted. <laughs> but she has this big grin from ear to ear. And she wow. said it was like the best night of her life. That's that's wild. Uh, so... Could, could you explain, and we spoke on the phone about this because I didn't know, but can you explain what China is like or was like then in terms of like the different parts of China? Because in my head, I was like, wait, limited on like the amount of children that right. one could have. Right. So when a lot of people hear the story, they assume like, oh, because of that one child rule, that's mm -hmm. why you were left on the bench. Right. And um, that's communist China. And mm. I was found in the Republic of China, which is where Taiwan is. And obviously being that my mother's housekeeper had nine kids, right. you can have as many kids as you want. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely not the reason that I was left on a bench. Um, it's funny because I used to always think that I was like half Asian. Like one of my biological parents was European or I thought maybe more like maybe my father was, you know, European, like a visiting student at the college. And my mother was this young, mm -hmm. you know, Asian girl that got pregnant. And of course, it was a big shame on the family because, you know, um, 
Chinese people are very into like their kavod, you know, right. and, and this would have been like totally not accepted. Um, and then that's why I was left. One of the reasons I think that is because I feel like my features, even though I look Chinese, I look more like a sort of what you would expect to come from like a mixed union you know not so much that i look so so chinese yeah i cannot tell at all so it could be the shades but but it could, <laughs> no I, I don't know I, I i'm not in that world and enough then my to know. kids don't look that asian so you would think that my kids if i was really 100 percent asian would come out looking more like but your husband's not asian my husband right but you know how, like when you meet like biracial couples right the children always kind of yes take i understand the, that. Right, uh -huh. the dominant so that's why i thought maybe i was from a mixed union and my children are already like the watered down version mm -hmm. Um, and one day, like on Shabbos, we're like having this conversation. My kids were over, like my kids come over Shabbos afternoon. It's really nice. I have three kids that live in Baltimore that are married. And, um, you know, Shabbos afternoon is just like chill time, you know, and we were sitting on the porch and we were talking and I said something about that. And one of my married sons pipes up, no, Ma, you're hundred percent Chinese. And I look at him like, oh, really? How do you know that? He goes, I know. I'm like, really? How do you know that? And he's like, I know. And I'm like, okay, you don't know. And finally he goes, I do know because my father-in-law was curious and sent me to do a genetic testing kit. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so he said it came back that my son was 51% Asian and 49% European, hmm. which makes sense. Um, being that my husband comes from, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I can't sit here and say that I, you know, because now I know that, no, I guess I am 100% Chinese. Um, and my kids are... Would yeah. it practically make a difference in your story or not really? Not really. Just, I guess in my head, it was right. more like, oh, for sure, one of my parents is like Caucasian and whatever. And, you know, um, like I'm tall for an Asian person. I'm big boned for an Asian, you know, Asian mm. people are usually like tiny petite. And, um, you know, I'm not so, I mean, I'm short, but I'm not very petite or tiny. Mm. Um, so I just always thought, now my father used to always say, you know, he was a sociologist. So he always would talk about, nurture versus nature. Mm. And he would say that I'm um, taller and, you know, because of my diet, because Chinese people eat like a lot of rice and a lot of vegetables. And I was eating an American diet of cheese and milk and, you know, mm -hmm. things that make your bones grow, you know, bigger and stronger. And so he always thought that's why I always said, oh, but I'm not so tiny, like these tiny little Chinese people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he would be like, because you ate an American diet. Very interesting. Okay. I'm very curious about like, you know, what the research you've done into your background, but I, before then, could you take us through your parents' journey? Because if they weren't Orthodox at the time, and clearly you're Orthodox now, like when did that transition happen? So that was a long transition. As I mentioned, so through the process of um, adopting me, they had to get all the paperwork and all the, um, it turned out to be that this Reverend Wu actually was not a legal um orphanage he sold babies shocker right oh <laughs> right the guy who took 25 dollars exactly, right like shocking that he wasn't actually illegal uh and so through the process of adopting me um he ended up getting arrested and my parents got their 25 dollars back and i was actually free oh so, okay yeah. <laughs> um so it doesn't matter how strong the dollar was in china then <laughs> i was the best mitzi my parents got wow um but yeah so then my parents did all the paperwork and we returned to the united states in august um and there was like this huge welcoming party for my parents because, you know, everyone was excited that they were coming back from China. And um, my, um, you know, my mother's side of the family, which I had mentioned, were from. My grandmother actually was a twin and her twin stayed from and amongst many of her other siblings. And she chose to not, which mm -hmm. I always find interesting because usually they say twins have this like very tight, yes. you know, bond. So it was interesting that one, you know, the, the boy decided to stay from and my grandmother decided not to. Um, but my mother always sort of had a little bit of connection with, with that side of the family. And we're actually very, very close now. Um, and so they were all there also to greet and welcome them back from China and meet the new, you know, baby. And one of my mother's aunts came over to her and said, oh, you know, Mazel Tov, it's so nice that you have this baby, but you know, she's not Jewish, right? And my mother said, yeah, yeah, we know, but don't worry. You know, we're going to make her Jewish. How hard could it be? And, you know, this aunt said, okay, well, maybe I could ask you to do me a favor. She said, I know that you've waited so long for a child just give her the best, you know, conversion that is out there. Something that won't be questioned by anybody. You know, we know you're going to want to buy her the most beautiful clothing and the best toys and the safest car seat. And, you know, so just give her the best conversion that you can. And my mother's like, okay, sure. No problem. You know, <laughs> then Little they, did she know. yeah, exactly. You know, whenever I say that, you know, depending on the audience I'm talking to, I see people starting to chuckle or not, or, you know, um, and then my parents moved to Richmond, Virginia, where my father became the dean of the sociology department of the University of um, Virginia. And um, the first thing they did after they moved was, you know, try to make me Jewish. So my mother remembered her promise and they called the Orthodox rabbi 
Um, again, remember it's Richmond, Virginia. I mean, you think Baltimore is out of town. Richmond yeah. is like really out of town. <laughs> Um, and he sat down with my parents and he basically said, listen, you know, I'm not really interested in doing this because there's so many Jews in the world that don't know what it is to be a Jew. And I don't need this on my Achrayas that I'm going to bring another Jew into the world that's going to grow up eating treif, not keeping kosher, you know, not knowing what it is to be a Jew. Um, and so my parents sort of understood from that, that the rabbi was saying, if you're not willing to like become from yourself, I'm not willing to help you. And my parents were like, well, no, we're not becoming, you know, Orthodox, no way. Like, you know, and my father looked at my mother and said, okay, you can tell your aunt that we tried, but this is like way bigger than just converting her. So they went back and they opened up the yellow pages and they like look under rabbi and they find a rabbi, you know? So they sit down with him and he says right away, okay, no problem. This will be awesome. Like just sign this piece of paper and your daughter will be Jewish. And, you know, again, don't forget my father studied, you know, the culture of people, why people do things. And... You know, like he looks at my mother and they looked at each other and they're like, OK. And, you know, he said, isn't there something more to it than just signing this piece of paper? And the guy was like, no, just sign this piece of paper. She'll be Jewish. No problem. And so, you know, that wasn't really what my parents were looking for either. Mm -hmm. um, so they thanked the rabbi and they got up and they left, you know. And my father always says that, you know, he thought to himself, wait a minute, like if just signing a piece of paper is what makes a person Jewish, then all the terrible things that have happened to the Jews throughout history, you just take your piece of paper and you rip it up, hmm. you know, like the Holocaust. No, I'm not Jew. I mean, during the Holocaust, people that didn't even know they were Jewish and, you know, their their lineage was, was you know, found all the way back. They were taken to the concentration camps because, you know, somehow there was Jewish blood in them. Um, the Spanish Inquisition, all the things that, you know, happened to Jews, just take your paper and rip it up and you're not Jewish. So... My father felt like there has to be something a little bit more to being a Jew than just, you know, signing your name. So they said, OK, don't worry. There are plenty of rabbis in the, you know, in the phone book. So they open it up again. They find another one. At this point, when they went, met with this other rabbi, my mother had read up a little bit on, you know, conversion. And the guy again said, OK, just sign this piece of paper. Your daughter will be Jewish. No problem. You can pick a Jewish name. It'll be awesome. And my mother said, well, what about like mikvah? Isn't there something like a little bit more to it? Then it was like, oh, no, that's so old fashioned. But like, if you really feel like it's important, we can go to the JCC. Hmm. We'll kick everyone out of the pool. We'll dunk your daughter in a couple of <laughs> times, pull her out. You know, it's, it's the same thing. It's water, you know. Um, and then my mother was like, my mother's obviously the more spiritual, you know, you know, they say Nashim or more, you know, closer to creation. So we have that little. Uh, right. Um, and my mother was just like. OK, but it just doesn't feel like spiritual, like it should be something special, like she's coming and joining the Jewish people. Like, so he's like, you know what? I have a great idea. You want to make it spiritual? We're going to make it really spiritual. He goes, we'll invite the Chinese community to come join us. We'll open up our synagogue. We'll combine Israeli food and Chinese food. We'll play Israeli music and Chinese music. We'll combine the two cultures and it will be an incredibly spiritual, uniting, beautiful night. And my mother was like. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so they looked at each other, you know, they got up and they walked out and they were like, OK, listen, I was only a couple months old. There was no rush to make me Jewish. And my father's like, OK, you know, in a couple months down the line, we'll deal with it. And as I'm sure, you know, time goes by very quickly and a couple months turned into a couple of years. And I was four years old and it was time for me to go to school. And obviously they wanted to enroll me in the Jewish school. But little problem, I wasn't Jewish. <laughs> So, um, you know, I always tell people that my story is the story of Hashkacha Pratis and how HaKadosh Baruch Hu is just constantly in our lives and, you know, taking care of us, even if we think he's busy with this and busy with that. But he he is, but he's also watching over us. And, um, you know, nothing is ever by chance. And my father was sitting in a Hill house, which is, you know, like uh, on different campuses, they have either a Hill house, Hill room. And um, he was reading his newspaper like he always liked to do. And uh, this young guy sits across from him, starts to schmooze with him. It's a Friday. And he invites my father for Shabbos. Hmm. So my father goes, oh, it's so nice of you, but it's not just me. I have a wife, I have a child. And then they get into the whole conversation. And it comes out, obviously, that I'm not Jewish yet and that I need to go to school. And it's a little bit of a problem and they don't know what to do. So this rabbi says, you know what? Come into my house for Shabbos. And um, I think I can help you after Shabbos. And my father's like, yeah. But he goes, yeah, bring your wife, bring your child. It's, it's great. So my father called my mother. My mother was like already very used to, you know, used to things like this. Yeah. And my father's like, pack a suitcase, like we're going, you know. My English name at the time was Kim. Very typical Asian American, you know, yeah. name. Um, and we went to this family for Shabbos. And it was really an incredible experience. I remember being four and I still remember like the door opening and this amazing, warm feeling and smell. Hmm. Um, I found out afterwards it was roasted chicken and chalent hmm. that, you know, I was like, wow, that's like the most incredible smell ever. And I just had, I had a great job. And, um, you know, people sometimes will say like, but don't you remember being told you can't do this, you can't do that. 
I'm like, no, I just remember it being like an incredibly warm, loving, like an incredible experience. Like mm. I did not at all, again, I was four, but what I remember was just very positive. Nothing at all like, can't do this, you can't, you know, be careful, don't do that. We don't turn on lights, we don't, you know. Um, and Sunday morning, my parents sat with the uh, Rav and his wife and he started again, like, well, I don't know, you know, I, how, why should I bring another Jew into the world that, and my parents were thinking, oh no, he just said he's gonna help us to get us to come to him for Shabbos and, you know. Mm. But then he said to my parents, you know, if you're willing to take upon yourself three things um, that will give you a foundation of Yiddishkeit and look at your life like a ladder, you know, and you're starting at the bottom rung and as you feel ready, you'll climb higher and higher, mm. then I'm willing to help you because at least your daughter will grow up with an identity that she is a Jew and how you go further is up to you. Um, and he said that the three mitzvahs were Shabbos, um, Kashras, and Taras Mashbacha. And he said, if you're willing to take these three mitzvahs upon yourself, then I'm willing to help you. So, you know, my father thought to himself, whoa, like I could do that. You know, that makes sense to him. Like, you're not going to go and, you know, bring a Jew into the world and say, okay, like now you're a Jew, let's go eat a McDonald's hamburger, you know, like. Right. Um, and he thought also like he wasn't being told to take all 613 mitzvahs upon himself at one time. Like this was doable. We'll get to the 610 later. <laughs> um, and so he learned with the Rav and my mother learned with the Rebetzin. And, um, I was McGuired and I was given the name Devora. Um, I remember it very clearly. I did not know how to swim. I remember my father standing in the mikvah in his bathing suit. <laughs> and I remember these like three men like standing up higher, you know, and they turned their backs. Um, and I just remember being like dunked and I did not know how to swim. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I, like I'm gonna die. Like I'm drowning. Like, why is my father doing this? You know? Oh my gosh. And my father was like speaking, he was, you know, speaking very loving words mm -hmm. and like, and but I was just like focused on the fact that, you know, and then he pulls me up and then he did it again, like two more times. And oh, I'm like, well, what is going on? You know? <laughs> um, and I remember being like taken out like the last time and I'm like sputtering and there's like water and like, you know, like they're clapping above and they're going muscle to muscle, you know? And I just remember thinking like, I hate the water and I do up till today. I hate the water. I love going to the pool. I love sitting by the beach. I love sitting by the pool. I don't go in the water From if I don't have to. From being four years old and yeah, going to Yeah, I just don't. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I, I oh, well, yeah. it, it, there's only, you know, one uh, main time. Interesting. Okay, so it's remarkable that you basically are the reason why your parents became yeah. Orthodox. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then what's even more unusual, or I should say more amazing, is that my parents did slowly, slowly start to take more mitzvahs upon themselves as, you know, more time went on. Because um, there's so many. They're like, we could, shluch khan, okay, we'll, we'll put right. that into the fold. Okay, <laughs> we could handle that. Yeah, but they really, you know, my parents really embraced it like wholeheartedly, like, slowly, very slowly. Like right. my father started off by wearing like a, a tie-dye kippasuga. Mm -hmm. And then he went to like a navy kippasuga and then a black kippasuga. You know, my mother went from like, covering her hair with like a tichel. And then I think she finally took like the jump, but she bought herself a shade from like JC Penney. Oh. They did sell shade in those days. Um, I think she burnt all those pictures from <laughs> that time. Um, you know, my father went from like, you know, he wore like a blue velvet yarmulke to like a black velvet yarmulke and like a gray hat with a red feather to like the blue hat with the red feather to like the black hat with the red feather. And then finally just, you know, the black, black hat. hat. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, yeah, like it was just, it was a very slow process, but it was done, you know, my father did everything with a tremendous amount of love and, you know, in, was able to instill in us a feeling of a love of Yiddishkeit also, which, you know, sometimes people come up to me and say like, oh, don't you feel deprived? You grew up in a Baal Tshuva home, like your parents couldn't like really help you or, you know, and I, I said, it's true, you know, like when I had to write a paper on Minhagam that go back to like the Baal Shem Tov, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, our Minhagam started when my parents became from, which right. in a way was awesome because we could pick and choose what we wanted. <laughs> You know, um, but you know, it was it was hard. And my parents had to hire tutors for me for chumash and homework and everything because they just weren't able to help me. But I always say that they were able to give me something that I'm not so sure how many of us that grow up and from home some birth really have, and that is such an appreciation and love for Yiddishkeit, for the mitzvahs, for Shabbos, for the Yom Tovim. You know, um, and that was something that I you know I saw with my own eyes and I saw my parents really you know um, act on it. And it was something that was definitely passed on to all of us. And I hope I'm passing it on to my own children and grandchildren, but. Yeah. We'll be right back to our inspiring episode, but now it's time to fill your pocket with money you're sitting on without even realizing it. 
Ever wonder how your friends go on beautiful vacations and claims it costs them zero dollars? Here's the secret. Many people, possibly even you, are collecting credit card points and miles, but not doing anything with them. Here's the tip. Convert them into cash. Yes, cash. Our friends at The Paid Group will give you an instant cash quote on your credit card points or miles. And if you're responsibly spending money on a credit card, then you are racking up money. You just got to convert the points or miles. Then you can use the cash to pay for a flight, groceries, even back to school supplies for your children, literally. Want an instant cash quote? Simply visit thepaidgroup.com. That's P-E-Y-D. Link is in the show notes. And Penny and the awesome team at Paid will run the numbers and make you an offer. Tens of thousands of people have turned their points and miles into top dollars. My wife was ecstatic when we cashed in all our points and went away on a dream vacay. Now it is your turn. Again, visit thepaidgroup.com and fill out the short form. And be sure to select Living the Chaim slash Yaakov Langer in the referral section. And by the way, this is for those that currently have points and miles sitting and collecting dust. Don't go signing up for credit cards just to collect the points and miles because that may end up hmm, backfiring if you can't pay the credit cards. Now, I want to invite you to join the 10th annual Tesla raffle from Chesed Chicago. You can win the Tesla Model X, S, Y, 3, or even the Cybertruck or opt for $50,000 cash. Chesed Chicago, founded by the beloved Dain Rev Shmuel first and formerly known as the Chicago Chesed Fund, is an amazing organization helping families in crisis. They're funding over 80 essential programs, providing everything from food and furniture to job placement and help navigating governmental assistance. It's amazing. By entering this raffle, you're not just getting a chance to drive away in a gorgeous Tesla or pocket $50,000 cash. You're making a real difference for families in need. Your donation helps sustain vital services that bring hope and stability to those facing very tough times. For your chance to win, head to ccraffle.com. Use promo code L'chaim to get $25 off two tickets or $500 off 15 tickets. But hurry, tickets are limited to 9999 and The raffle will close soon as the Tickets are sold. So the drawing ends September 9th, but it could end faster. ccraffle.com. Use the code word L'chaim today. Again, once all the tickets are sold, it's done. Guys, we do this every year, and I'm hoping, and and Siat Deshmaya, an inspiration listener, will win this year. Go ahead and use the code L'chaim. Of course, the link's in the show notes. Let's get back to this week's episode. I'm so curious. So how how was school or no yeshiva is not really for girls but how was school for you was it easy did you integrate so when well? I lived in Richmond Virginia it was one day school mm-hmm. um, we were five boys and five girls <laughs> um, and it was fine because everyone just knew me I was given the Hebrew name Devora. oh and what I forgot to mention which was like the most astounding part was close to a year after I was McGuire'd my mother had her first biological son mm. which was 12 years after marriage wow And a lot of times people will say, oh, that's not so unusual. People adopt and then they go on to have biological children. And my father would always say, yeah, but we were married for 12 years and we had Devorah for almost four years before, you know, they became pregnant. And, you know, he felt like it was only after I was McGuire that my mother became pregnant. And it was like Hashem tapping him on the shoulder, like Hmm. you did good, you know, and and then following that came three more brothers. Wow. So, yeah. Um, So like that was like amazing. So I went to school there. It was called the Rudland Torah Academy. Um, it was a day school, you know, and um, when I was nine years old, my parents decided to go to Israel for a six month sabbatical. My father went to learn Or Samea. I feel like your father's doing a lot of sabbaticals, no? He's, yeah, he's going he, to well, Taiwan. That's part, that's part to... of being like a, you know, a, right. a professor. You right, know? right. The sabbatical in Taiwan was actually a paid, you know, it was, right, right. It was a, he was working. But and... yeah, but no, he took the, he was able to take this like six month sabbatical, you know, he had tenure, tenure and, um, you know, whatever. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. I'm the worst person okay. to ask. Well, I'm the worst person to ask. My family makes fun of me all the time <laughs> because I grew up in Eretz Yisrael, which we'll get to soon. Yeah. Um, I was a huge reader. My grandfather would send me books all the time from uh, America. So you know how to, the word I is. I know how to use to them. Yeah. I know how to spell them. But the way I pronounce them, my family, it's like I'm their butt of all their jokes. That's because funny. like They're always like, okay, let's ask Ma. How is she going to pronounce and this? People you know? in the comments could uh, tell yeah, us how to pronounce I, yeah. it. <laughs> but uh, okay, so you're, you're in Israel for six months. And right, you're, and I'm nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and my father was learning in Orsameach, my mother was learning in Vey, and I was plopped into this like base Yaakov, you know, um, and nobody really knew how to deal with me because here in America, even your most insula- insulated, you know, people, wherever they are, they are exposed to Gayim and they right. are exposed to Asian people, right. like your manicurist, your dry cleaner, your grocer, right. you know, like 
you're just you're exposed to them. There you are know, Asian you people know, right, in America. You know America. who they are. You know. Um, and, but in Israel, not not really. Nowadays, more because they brought in a lot of Asian workers to be um, healthcare aides and helpers. Right, right, right. But we're talking like but not Chinese, not. I mean, but whatever. Yeah, they are. They're Asian. In fact, yeah, yeah. In fact, unfortunately, a lot of some of the people that were kidnapped on October seventh um, oh. were were like Thailand nationals. Right, right, and, right. And the, I'm they were of that person who, who we got back. I right, yeah. Name. They were they were what do you call right. it? They were. Oh, okay, um, now that you say you're right. Uh-huh. You know, they were aides. They were on the on the moshavs or mm-hmm. whatever they were. But when, when you're nine years old, they're no. And this, you're talking any, years ago. Right. You're talking like you know over thirty years ago, and and you know there were no there were no Asians really. The only Asians there were maybe the waiters and waitresses in the trafe. Like Chinese restaurants or even the kosher restaurants, but I think you know it's even whenever you pick up an American kid and put, bring them to put them in class in Israel, that transition oh, for is difficult. Sure, then, for sure, then surely when you're Asian, for sure, that like, was just like five hundred times worse. Right. For yeah. sure, you know, and like the kids in the Beis Yaakov, they just did not know what to do with me. You know, I had a very hard time, but um, and also it's a totally different culture. Like, right. I got into trouble because I drew a picture of a kala. On you know, on a piece of paper, I was nine years old. I mean, that's what girls do, you right. know. Right. Yes. Um, and apparently, it was like not accepted. It mm-hmm. was like inappropriate that I was thinking of things like you know. Would have been worse if you drew a chassan. Uh, that's also true. Yeah. Good point. But you but know, that, it was it was like a different culture. Right. You yeah, know? yeah. It's very different. Um, and my and my parents are just oblivious. They're in their own little words, right. happy, you know. And I was like, I made some really, really, really good friends. Um. I made really good friends with, you know, it's funny because when I hear these names out there now, like Rabbi Dov Gottlieb, you know, his daughter Devorah and I became best friends. Hmm. And, um, you know, um, Rebbe Sin Heller, I became best friends with her daughters. Like we have pictures of me in, in that time period. Hmm. You know, we, I just hung out with them and it was amazing. They were English speakers. We would spend Shabbos in their houses and it was just a ton of fun for me. So I didn't really focus so much on school, but mm-hmm. more like you know, the friendships I was building. And then when I was 11, we, you know, we moved back to the States. And when I was 11, my parents decided to actually make the big jump and make Aliyah. Mm-hmm. And that's when everything got really like intense. Um, they put me into, a, again, a base Yaakov um, that was not prepared for me at all. Um, and there was a girl there and she saw that I looked different and she was not shy about it. And mm. she would write the word guy on my desk oh, every man. day. Um, and I would be like, okay. And I would erase it, you know, and she would write in and, you know, and none of the girls really knew what to do with me. They were just like, she's so like different looking. Who is she? Where is she? Like, is she a Martian that came down to like, you know? Um, and so it was really hard for me. And one day I just decided, you know what? I had enough, like, I'm not doing this. I'm not dealing with this. And, you know, people are like, why don't you tell your parents? And I was like, what am I going to tell my parents? Like, what's my mother going to do? Like call the principal, principal's going to call the girl, like yell at her. And then she'll just find different ways to torment me. Not as you know, obvious. So I was like, oh, I'll just take things into my own hands. Um, and I basically told my mom that there was um, a three-day teacher conferences, not teacher parent, but just teacher conferences. And there was no school for three days. And my mom was like, how come there's no letter? There's, I'm like, ma, it's Israel. Like, you know, everything's very chill. Like, yeah. you know, like, oh, just tell your parents like that. And so by then my mother had dealt with enough, you know, right. she was like, okay, fine. Like, fine, no problem. So like I woke up the first day and it was awesome. Like I woke up, I walked to the Makolet, um, I bought myself an ice cream. I told you I was a big reader. I had a great book. I went to the park. School ends at one. So it wasn't like I had this like huge amount of time I had to like, you know, mm-hmm. fill. But, um, you know, by the time I davened and did everything, it was like already half the morning was gone. Um, and at one o'clock I came back and it was great. Second day, had a new book, bought mm-hmm. myself, you know, some chocolate, bisley, you know, went to the park again. Um, and it was awesome. And I was saying to myself, like, why didn't I think of this sooner? Why did I only say three days? I should have said like a week, you <laughs> know? Um, and then the third day, the principal called. Hmm. And he was like, oh, hi, Mrs. You know, Schwarzbaum, how are you? And she was like, oh, good, how are you? He's like, great. He's like, how's Devora? Oh, Devora's doing great. Um, and he's like, okay, well, you know, we really miss her. You know, where is she? And my mother's like, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> what do you mean, where is she? You know, she's she's been enjoying these past couple of days, you know? And he was like, oh, but, you know, she hasn't been. And it came out that basically there was school and I wasn't in school. And that's when my parents realized, okay, you know, we got to do something different. And they were pulled me out of that school and they put me into- And you told them what happened? Or? I told them what happened, Got yeah. It, okay. And of course they felt terrible and, you right. know, and, um, but whatever, you know, so we right. moved on and they put me into a more Mizrahi school. It wasn't mm. such a base Yaakov, you know, mm-hmm. in the square, in the box type school. Um, and there the girls really just welcomed me like unbelievably, like very mm. warm. And, you know, I was invited to a lot of girls' houses. Um, it's funny because one time when I was flying back to Eretz Yisrael, my stewardess in Alal actually was- a girl that I went to school with. And oh, no, yeah, it was very funny. cute. She was like, Devora? <laughs> and I'm like, Emanuela? You know? <laughs> so it was it was really, it was very cute. Um, she brought me like all kinds of stuff from like first class and, you know, 
But, um, and there I had a really great time. But when I came to high school, uh, my parents wanted me to continue in the sister high school of that school. But I wanted to go back to Beis Yaakov. I felt like that was really where my hushkafos were. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, and the friends that I, I grew up in Baifagan in Yerushalayim. Mm-hmm. And my friends were all going to Beis Yaakov. So that's really what I wanted to do. Um, so I went to Beis Yaakov. It was called Beis Yaakov Hayashan. Um, it used to be when I went there next to the zoo, they've now moved the zoo all the way down to like Mamila, but, yeah. um, this used to be the, not Mamila, I'm sorry. Um, Mamila's yeah. by the I old city, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Um, down by like the train station, like the biblical zoo, like, yeah, the, whatever, you know? Um, but at the time when I was going to school, it was next to the zoo. Mm-hmm. Um, and we used to say we were the zoo next to the zoo because mm-hmm. <laughs> we, and we, it was huge. They were, I, in my ninth grade, there were probably 12 parallel classes 55 girls per class. Wow. Yeah. And then you had ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Um, BJJ is located in that building and they had their own two year seminary program. So you can imagine it was like this gigantic chess shaped building, like three or four like stories. It was huge. Wow. Um, and I actually bumped into that girl that wrote the word guy on my desk. Um, it was the first day of school. I was very late and very lost, as you know. <laughs> I have a tendency to get lost. Um, and, you know, being that I also hadn't gone to a base Yaakov beforehand, I didn't take the tour of mm. the school. So I was this new kid, new building, new, huge school. Bell had rung, could not find my classroom. And I'm walking down this humongous, huge, empty hallway. And coming towards me, I see this figure also walking. I'm like, oh, yay, there's someone else that's lost. And as we get close to each other, I'm like, oh, shoots, it's the girl that wrote the word guy on my desk, you mm. know. Um, and I look at her and she looks at me. I can see she recognized me also, not that I'm hard to recognize. Um, and we didn't say anything to each other, but I always tell people that, you know, eyes are the windows to the soul. You can always see if someone's talking to you, you could see through their eyes. Are they engaged in what you're saying? If you tell them something sad, like, are they feeling your pain? Are they, you know, participating in your simcha? Because people's eyes are really very, you know, you, you could read them. And... Um, I could see in her eyes, she remembered what she did and she was embarrassed and she felt badly, you know, Mm. and she nodded to me and I kind of smiled and nodded back to her and we continued on our ways trying to find our classroom and I never saw her again. Mm. Um, Because you killed her. Probably. (laughs) (laughs) With my eyes. I was like, I remember what you did. (laughs) But but you felt some remorse on her. I did. I saw in her eyes. She like remembered what she did and she was like embarrassed. Like I saw Mm. the way she looked at me and then like lowered her eyes and then looked up at me again. And like I saw in her eyes, like, like if eyes could talk, her eyes were saying, I'm really sorry, Mm. you know, and. Um, and then we never saw each other and I like smiled at her and we just, you know, moved on. Went your own ways. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So let's fast forward to, um, to, to dating. Was that like a harder experience for you or? So it was, um, I was very nervous because I was always like, you know, like, I know like people like me and they like being around me and, you know, people might say like, oh, she's a great babysitter. She's a great chesed girl. She's like, oh, but to marry my son, like, I don't know, mm. you know? Um, and I was very concerned and I did, I did a lot, a lot of davening because I knew that ultimately Kaddish Baruch Hu is the ultimate shadchan, you know, um, I was a little crazy when it came to Segulas. Like I was always doing like whatever Segula was like, in, <laughs> you know, um, I remember when my seminary went to Amuka and it was like crazy hot and, um, we were in an air conditioned bus and the bus started to go up and I'm like, wait, I'm like the Segula is to walk up to Amuka, not go up in an air conditioned bus. Oh, gosh. And the Matricha was like, it's fine. So the, the Segula is to go and dive in there. And I'm like, no, the Segula is, you have to have a little bit of like hardship doing it. I'm like, I'm getting out and I'm walking. And she was like, I think you should just stay in the bus. I'm like, nope. And <laughs> two other girls hopped out with me. And, um, you know, we hiked up and we get up there. Everyone's like already like, hello. You know, we we didn't have as long a time to dive in as they did because right. they obviously, you know, right. went up in their nice air conditioned bus. Um, but I actually was the first girl in my seminary to get engaged. Ooh. So maybe some of those schools worked. Right. Um, but I was very nervous. Um, I did end up marrying the second boy that I went out with. Oh, cool. He was from Long Island and he was um, learning in Shari Chaim in um, Eretz Yisrael, in Matasdorf, under Rav Scheinberg, who was actually my Masada Kedushin. Hmm. So, um, yeah. And our Shachan was Rebbe Shane, Rucham Shane, who wrote the book off of the boss. Hmm. And, um, you know, that is a whole story in itself. But... But I was very concerned. And I remember like I would be read like the craziest shadokham. You know, like one time my father called me over at a wedding and, you know, he was like, you see that guy over there? And he pointed to this like old man, you know, and my father was like, someone just suggested you for him. And I looked at my father. I'm like, ha ha. He goes, no, really? I'm like, OK, then. He's like, yeah, don't worry. I said no. <laughs> I'm like, wow, ta, thanks. You take such good care of me. You know? <laughs> um, another time, like we were on our way to the Dead Sea and we had stopped off like at one of the rest stops like near Yericho. 
And my father said that someone came and offered him 10 camels for me. Like one of the Arabs was like, you know. That is a lot of camels. That's a lot of camels. Right? I mean, come on, you know, like, right. I was like, all right. Like that is something, you know, right. 10 camels, like one camel, 10. It's more than $25, you know. <laughs> That's for sure. It's so interesting because I, I mean, I, talking about, um, you know, that very mean girl and then talking about, I guess, your worry with dating, like you kind of always feel, you know, I think maybe sadly that like you kind of feel like an outsider towards yeah. I did have amazing friends, though. Like, mm. I will say friends are are gold. You know, mm. I could not have gotten through anything in my life without my really, really good friends. Um, and I'm still I'm still in touch with them up till today, even though we've all moved to different parts and different. But they were my li they were like my lifeline because mm. I would even I mean, it was interesting because I wasn't just like bullied by, let's say, you know, classmates The Israeli society didn't really know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. They were sort of like, who is this girl? You know, she's Asian, but she looks from and she's wearing a base of uniform. And but like, huh, how could that be? You know, so it can't be. There must be something off with her, or, you know. And every day that I would go to school, there was this I had to take the 710 bus and the bus driver would always make a huge to do every time I got on the bus. He would be like, oh, he ne he gia hasini, you know, like here's the Chinese one. <laughs> And I would like get on the bus, like with my, you know, Cartesian. I'd be like, oh my gosh, just, stand, you know, <laughs> just, just stand, let me just get on the bus. And everyone would turn around. And, and so I stopped taking that bus because I just, I, I couldn't, you know, right. I just didn't want to deal with it. Um, I once had a bunch of like not from boys chase me down the street with like rotten eggs and they were screaming like different things and throwing these like smelly rotten eggs at me, you know. Um, I would have adults stop me and be like, oh, you know, atsini, atida karate, you know, and they uh, would, mm. and I was like, I just wanted to like to sink into the woodwork, you know, right. just leave it's me alone, you know? It's such cringe experiences. Oh my god! And here I am a girl, you know, I'm like in my like preteen years. You know, I don't want anyone looking at me. I don't right. want anyone talking to me. Like everyone just leave me alone. And these things are happening like on the street. And so I learned to surround myself with my friends. I never went anywhere by myself because mm -hmm. then if somebody would start to make fun of me or say something, my friends would immediately like, you know, divert my attention from that and start to schmooze with me or talk to me. Or sometimes they would also like totally like stand up for me. And, you know, but I, no, I'm like, just stop. And I would tell them like, I really appreciate it, but that just makes it more of a scene. And right, like, right, so right. let's just like move on, you know? Right. Um, and it's funny because I didn't realize how much I took that with me into my adulthood even until we moved to the United States, which was about 26 years ago. Um, and I had to go to Target. And I called one of my friends and I was like, hey, I need to go to Target. Do you want to come with me? She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Just put the baby down. I'm like, okay. I called another friend. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. My clean lady just you know, came. Called another friend. And she was like, oh, I can't. I just, you know. And I got to the fourth friend and I was like, oh, I'm like, you're like the fourth person I tried. I'm like, I just, I need to go to Target. I mean, everyone's like busy. And there's like silence. And she was like, Devora. And I said, yeah. She's like, why can't you go to Target yourself? <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> good point. Like, I'm a mother of five. Why can't I go to Target myself? Right. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, I can go to Target myself. Um, and I did. And I was like, it just, but for me, it was a very eye-opening thing that, you know, here I am this mother of five, you know, and I, I just never went anywhere myself. Mm -hmm. um, don't worry, I go a lot of places now myself. Well, you came here by <laughs> yourself. Here myself, I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> but you did say you, you wanted your daughter to come I with you. I did want my daughter to come. I tried to convince her to come with me, but. <laughs> so what what was your, was there a quest for you to meet your biological parents? And if there was, what was the conversation with your parents about that? So I was always very observant um, from the time I was very little. Um, I know my students go crazy because I'm the teacher that notices that they're wearing the orange nail polish or, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, they're not really following the uniform guidelines. You know, the other teachers are like totally oblivious. <laughs> um, so I know it's a little bit annoying that I have that, you know, but I am a very observant person. And um, when from the time I was little, I just noticed that I looked different than my parents and I looked different than my brothers. My my first brother, Dovi, who was born after myself, um, He's, he was like blonde with big blue eyes. And, you know, so obviously I'd be like, we look nothing alike. <laughs> and then my next brother, Davi, was born and he also was blonde and blue eyed. And, you know, and each, you know, so I would ask my parents, like, how come I look different than you? How come I look different than them? Why don't, you know, what's it? And my parents are always very, very, very open about everything. And I am a very strong believer about this. I, you know, when I speak to parents that have adopted or, you know, I always say you must be open with your children. You must because secrets are never, ever, ever hidden. They might come out 10 days later. They might come out a year later. They might come out 40 years later. But at the end of the day, a secret always comes out and it never comes out in a good way. You know, and wouldn't you rather be the one to tell your child what they should know than have them find out in some crazy, you know, way? Um, so my parents always told me, like, you know, that they really wanted children. They really wanted a family. They weren't able to. And then one day, you know, 
Tao was like taking a train in China and um, Hashem just put you on the bench that, you know, your biological mother loved you so much that she couldn't take care of you. And she left you on this bench with a note in a jacket and Ta found you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu just, you know, plopped you into our lives. And through that, you know, we we found Yiddishkeit and we became from and, you know, and then HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, you know, more sons. And so, you know, I'd be like, oh, okay. And then I'd always be curious though, like, but who was my, I never was really curious about my father, but I was always curious about my biological mother. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and my parents were always very open and they'd be like, you know, we totally understand. My mother wasn't the type that was like, what? You want to go searching for your, you know, biological mother, but I'm your mother, you know, how dare you? Like, you know, like I'm so insulted. No, she was always like, okay, Ziske, you know, she'd always hold me and like hug me and kiss me and say, I totally understand why you want to find your biological mother. Like I'm your real mother, but your biological mother is the one who carried you. And, you know, we'd also love to find her and say, thank you so much for, you know, carrying her, you know, carrying you and delivering you and leaving you on the bench. You know, couldn't have been easy. Um, and, you know, that Hashem was, she was the shlicha that, you know, gave you to us. But they would say, you know, you're six years old now. You can't go across the world to go searching for your, you know, biological mother. Why don't you wait till you're 18? Um, and then you can go. We can go with you. You can go yourself. And like, I was six years old. I got it. It wasn't like they were saying, absolutely not. You can't do this. You know, I was like, yeah, true. I can't really get on a plane and go. Um, so, you know, and I would ask again at seven and eight and nine. And, you know, my parents are always like, 100%, we're with you. You can go searching for them. But just not now. You have to wait till you're a little older. And then when I was 11, we moved to Israel. And my whole life just like fell apart. Um, just because, you know, I was being bullied and I was being teased. And um, so like the thought of finding my biological mother just like fell out of my head. I was completely not interested. Mm. Um, yeah. And I just now, I mean, now myself, like sometimes when I go and speak, some, you know, I'll open up the audience to questions. It depends on the what type of event it is, you know. And the question I always get is, do you want to find your real mother? <laughs> you know, and then I always very gently, you know, correct them and say, well, I know where my real mother is, you mm. know. She, her name is Rachel Schwartzbaum. She lives in Eretz Yisrael. Um, if you mean by my biological mother, mm. uh, and I would always say, I never really was so curious to find her um, until I actually became a mother myself. Mm. And then it wasn't so much that I wanted to find her. I just sort of wanted to say thank you to her because, mm. you know, I know being a mother now myself, you know, raising a child and, you know, those late night feedings, um, you know, everything that you do, the pregnancy, giving birth, it's all worth it when you hold that baby, you know, mm. and you look at that little face and you just, you just marvel at the tremendous nace of it. And then, you know, just, it, you're just so grateful. And I think to myself that my biological mother didn't even try. Like she knew that the best way for me, you know, my best chances of survival were to be to give me up right away, not to try to see if she could raise me, if she could, you know, and then I'd be this like toddler that would be hard to, you know, try to give to someone to adopt. Um, and, you know, the fact that she wrapped me in this red silk jacket and wrote such a beautiful note, it shows that she really gave me out of love, mm. not out of, you know, like, I don't want this kid. Um, so I would really just want to find her and say thank you, because I can imagine how hard that must have been. Mm. Um, but never found her, never, never really even tried. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I know my father did. Um, he did? Well, he didn't really try. What happened is that um, when Israel opened up diplomatic relations with um, China, they opened up a an embassy in um, Tel Aviv. And somehow it came to the embassies. Um, I guess they said, oh, you know, we have this amazing couple. They speak Hebrew. They speak Chinese. Um, we went back to China when I was five for a year. My father received another one of those um, awards. So my mother speaks Chinese fluently. My father learned a little bit. And so they were like, here's this, you know, Israeli Jewish Orthodox couple that also speaks Chinese. Like, <laughs> And they were like, oh, yeah, let's invite them to the embassy party. This would be like so cool, you know. So they did. And um, there, there was a journalist who wrote for like one of the biggest newspapers for China. I mean, I don't know what you would compare that to nowadays since people don't really read <laughs> newspapers, but you know, whatever that big newspaper is, that's where there, this journalist was from. And um, he asked my father if he could write up my story. And my father said, sure, because he felt like that was his way of doing his you mm -hmm. know? And so he wrote up the story, this journalist, and wrote at the end, if anybody has any information, you know, about this baby that was found on May 6th and such a train station, please contact the newspaper. And nobody came forward. Mm. So, you know, we always speculated, like, was it because maybe the person was dead? Maybe they can't read, you know, maybe, maybe they just read it and said, hey, she's happy. She's healthy. She's like, why, why, you know, why rock the boat? Right. Very interesting. We'll be right back to this week's episode. And trust me, the next story is next level. But this week is different. You heard me talk about Bitbean and how they are by far the best software solutions company that you could bring into really, really help your company. But I'm not going to talk about the amazing service they do. No, 
This week, I'm going to talk about them as people. We have been dealing with bipping for over six months now, and I can tell you firsthand that I personally see why they are successful. Yes, they truly help companies scale, grow, and make more money, but I think their secret is that they hire really talented people who understand people. Running a business is complicated. That's why you need the best people to be working with you, and that's what bipping humans are, the secret sauce. They are these smart really kind, helpful people that are looking to eliminate issues. And I highly recommend you reach out to Bitbean because they are the best people to help you take your company to the next level. We'll be right back to our inspiring episode, but now I'm excited to share an amazing offer from Twillery. As I record this, I'm wearing one of their athletic shirts and of course, their pants. Twillery just launched their incredible ear shirts, perfect for hot days because it breathes. It is insane technology. And here's the best part. Use the code word INSPIRE to get $18 off your order of $136 or more. Plus, don't miss their August warehouse sale with up to 50% off site-wide on shirts, polos, pants, blazers, and more. And now through Labor Day, you can get that. And I'm excited because I just ordered their polo shirt with a zipper. It's going to look really cool. So, Twillery.com is the place to go to upgrade your wardrobe with fantastic deal today. Go ahead, use the code word INSPIRE and enjoy your twills. Do you think you became a teacher because of your experience that wasn't so good to try to help people in your situation or, or no, not? No, I don't think so. Because like even when I lived in Richmond, Virginia, I always like play teacher. You uh-huh. know, I always wanted to be a teacher. I don't know why. I just, I loved it. I actually took a brief, I taught fifth grade for um, about 12 years in Basiaco, Baltimore. And then I took a year sabbatical. I just felt like I was getting a little burnt out. And I was Also, it's, it's, it's what your father used to do, so. Oh, take a sabbatical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I wasn't looking for any babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Um, I just felt like I was getting a little burnt out. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I said, I want to leave when people are sad to see me leave and not when like people are like cheering or, you know, mm-hmm. like it's time to leave, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and in that year, I really missed it. I took an office job. Um, it wasn't really for me. My husband always laughs that like my family is my Basiaco family. You know, mm-hmm. my co-teachers, the people I work with, we become very invested in each other's lives and we work together, we teach together. And I, I really miss that having, you know, an office job. Um, and then I actually interviewed to be an assistant Hebrew principal hmm. um, for a school that was opening up in Baltimore. And um, I thought this was very smart of them. They wanted to see me give a model lesson because they said, if you're going to be over other teachers, we want to see your style of teaching and how you interact with children. And I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. So I sat down and I prepared this whole model lesson. And I came back and I said to my husband, you know what? I don't want to be a principal. I want to go back to teaching. So hmm. I went back to Basiaco, Baltimore. My job was no longer available. Um, So I taught third grade English, uh, math and science. And then I became an assistant in first grade for Lamude Kodesh. And after three years, the teacher that I was an assistant to retired and I took over her class and I love it. I never thought I would. Um, I really never did. If anybody would have told me, I would have been like, there's no way I could teach first grade. No (laughs) way. You know, they're little, they're tiny. They're, you know, fifth grade I loved. Third grade was still, you know, older. Um, but when my fifth grade job opened up, my principal came to me and was like, Mrs. Goldstein, are you leaving us? And I'm like, nope, I'm here. So it's something that I really love. And I've been doing it now, I don't know, for a while, but I really like it. That's really beautiful. What, what advice would you have for people uh, thinking to adopt or they're not sure? Do you think it's, we're doing it enough? We're not doing it enough? So it's really hard for me to say personally, because, you know, I would never want to judge anyone until I'm in their shoes, you know? But I will tell you that I personally find it very sad that more people are not open to adoption. Um, I just feel like, you know, sometimes I, I meet people and they're married for X amount of years and, you know, they want they want that child. They want to have a family. And I sometimes think to myself, like, you could have that family. You could adopt a baby. I understand why people wouldn't want to adopt, you know, a five-year-old, a 13-year-old, uh, you know. But there's so many babies out there and maybe not so many Jewish babies, so adopt a baby and baby McGuire them, you know, in a way, like I was talking to my Rav about it once, and he was saying that in a way that's even better to take a baby and McGuire them because you know the baby is 100% Jewish. Like mm-hmm. sometimes when you adopt Jewish babies, you're not really sure mm-hmm. what the lineage is. You know, if there might be something questionable there, if there's some, you know, you're, you're just not sure. Right. Um, especially nowadays when some people don't even know they're Jewish. You know, I met this lady in Florida and she didn't even know she was Jewish. She didn't even know that it goes to the line of the mother. And her friend was with her, you know, and she was like, how could you not know that? You know, everybody knows that. And she was like, well, clearly I didn't, you know, and, <laughs> and it was like, but it was like sad to me that like, that's such an obvious thing. And, you know, who knows, 
you know, there are generations of people that maybe don't know that they're Jewish. Um, so, you know, I, and I think that, you know, a person that wants to be a mother, it doesn't have to go through the blood. You don't have to be a biological mother. You could be a mother by adopting a baby and that baby becomes yours. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mother, Rachel Schwarzman, is my mother. Um, and, you know, we're not related by blood. We're not related by anything genetic, but she's my mom, you mm -hmm. know? And it's like funny because in Israel, they when you sign up for PTA, I think I told you I went to this gigantic school. Um, they obviously did not do PTA the way we do it here. Um, you just kind of was like showed up and it was first come, first serve. <laughs> no names, no lists, no, you know. And my mother went for the first PTA and she walks in and she sits down and she's about to say whose mother she is. And the teacher looks at her and says, you must be Devorah's mother. And my mother said, yes, how do you know? You have the same smile. Mm. So, you know, I think there's just, you know, and there's a lot that I got from my mother. There's a lot I for sure got from my biological mother. My mother laughs all the time. Like, you know, I love to shop. I love, you know, I love jewelry and shoes. And, you know, my mother was like Mrs. Like natural, you know, <laughs> everything's natural. You know, I think she still has the tube of lipstick she wore at her wedding, hmm. you know, like not. A, and she's like, that obviously came from your biological mother because my mother's like, you didn't grow up in a house like that. You weren't <laughs> surrounded by that. You know, I didn't, you know, you didn't get influenced by me. Um, so I just, you know, I just think like, I know it's a big step, but I wish more people would, you know, explore it and not just wait and, you know, see what happens. And I'm not saying do it after two years. I'm not saying do it after, you know, <clears throat> but I just feel like it's, it's something that you could really make a family, you know, and weird question. Did you ever think to adopt or no? So Baruch Hashem, um, I had my first son. Um, I came home the night of my anniversary, <laughs> my <laughs> first anniversary with the baby. Yeah. Um, but I know that like after I got married, of course, you know, there's always that little thought like what, what if, what mm. if? Um, and I did. I was like, if I cannot have a biological child, I will adopt mm -hmm. because I want to be a mother and I want to have a family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, it is true. You know, there is something to having a biological child. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you 100% that the tie that I have with my mom is could be even stronger than wow. a biological child. Wow. Okay, towards the end of the interview, which, which by the way, I, I have to point out, and we've been speaking literally at this point for years, and I'm very thankful you give me a lot of feedback. You're a listener for the podcast. Which, I am. Which I'm honored. So before I get to the classic questions, first off, is there a particular episode or a person that I interviewed that like spoke to you a little more than others? So I am a huge fan. My family knows, you know, yeah. um, and it's my favorite thing to listen to when I'm driving or going somewhere or, um, you know, you've gone many places with me. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah many, many places with I me. I know, you, you messaged me like after, like, yeah. oh, thank you for coming. You just got on a crazy long drive, like 10 yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, you. you went to Italy with me. Yeah, that's fine. You were fine. in Aristotle with me. Yeah, I was sitting in traffic and listening to you, like, in my <laughs> ear, you know. Um, so I love all your episodes. They really, they all really speak to me. Um, and I don't know, I loved your episode with Libby. Um, she really struck a chord with me. Oh, I just, Weiss, yeah, she's I great. just, yeah. she was, she's just an incredible person. I really, I wish I could meet her one day. Um, you, you could. Yeah, she was I in would, like, she's yeah, like, very accessible. You know, I'll give you her number. I would, I would, I just was so impressed by her. I just, you know, um, you know, I've, I've cried by a lot of your, you know, your podcasts, um, Hadassah Lieberman. Um, That's Lowenstern. Lowenstern. Okay. okay my, again, my kids gonna make fun of me. I make I mess up everybody's names. Everybody. It's fine. It's fine. It's, <laughs> I mispronounce words and I mess up everybody's but names. I, I knew exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it was a very. Um, you know that episode. was like amazing, and um, you know so many of your, um, you know Mrs. Uh, Hirsch's mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rachel Goldberg. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Really, like so many. I'm feeling like you said three examples with women. Is it? Do you? Okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this on air, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm curious, and I finally have you here. Do you gravitate towards the episodes where I'm interviewing women or not particularly? I do. You do? Yeah. Like as soon as I see there's a woman, I'm like, oh, I click oh, on that. Oh, really? Yeah. And then I'll it's filter so funny through. My, my wife's friend told me the opposite. Oh, she's really? Like, she's like, I don't care to hear the women. I want you, like, she happens to be the Rabbanim. So she's like, I want to hear the Rabbanim. Oh, that's so funny. But it's just, I think everyone likes right, different likes people. Different, like, right. Yeah. Like I, I happen to like more the, you know, the, the you know, I, I, I guess just, I don't know. Are you going to listen to this episode or no? I don't know. Maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your kids are going to listen. I'll let my family listen to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so as you know, we we like to ask everyone their favorite mitzvah. Do you have a favorite mitzvah? I do have a favorite mitzvah. I actually, okay. I, lo I love a lot of the mitzvahs. And I remember thinking, like, he's going to ask me that question. I have to pick one. <laughs> the one that like really sticks with me, though, is I love Shabbos. Hmm. I absolutely love Shabbos. It could be because that was my first experience with Yiddishkeit, was right. when my parents went hmm. to that rough for Shabbos. 
Um, I'm one of those crazy people. I love three day Yemen Tovim. <laughs> I love them. I mean, you know, obviously the whole showers and whatever, but I love it. Like I, you know, someone was said to me, which you didn't really experience in Israel because you kept right. the one day no, and no, now you, no, now you're no, here. Now I'm here and I love it. Like, you know, everyone's going crazy. My block is going crazy. My, you know, my neighborhood chat. I love three day Yom Tovim. Um, one of my friends was like, you know, you should really go to Hawaii because apparently the way the sun moves or right, something, yeah, yeah, Yom Tov could be like four days yeah. or something like that or four and a half days. Yeah. She's like, Devar would be like your heaven. And I'm like, <laughs> I think just being in Hawaii would be great, you right. know, but, um, and I'll tell you, I just, I love Shabbos. I will tell you also, I think that also goes back to my parents when they started becoming from. So my father would always bring home a Shabbos treat for me because all of a sudden, don't forget, I went from being like, I could do anything to all of a sudden now, you know, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. Um, and so he would want me to look forward to Shabbos. Mm. And so there would always be a Shabbos gift on Friday. Mm. So it, sometimes it was a big gift, like a toy or a game. Sometimes it was just like a nosh, you know, but I always would look forward and say, you know, you know, daddy, where's my, where's my Shabbos, you know, gift Shabbos is coming. Where is it? And I would look forward to it. Mm. Um, and it's interesting because I always, always, as much as I love Shabbos, I always struggle with bringing a Shabbos on time. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't think from the first time I got married, I think my first Shabbos Shabbos was I was struggling with my shaytal. I couldn't <laughs> get it on, you know, and I, I lit like within that 18 minutes. <laughs> and I would always tell people I am the queen of 18 minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say there are probably times I probably bench left 18 minutes in like 42 seconds, you know, like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just could never. And, you know, people would always try to give me like advice like, oh, well, in your head, just say Shabbos is 10 minutes earlier. I'm like, do you think I'm stupid? Like, <laughs> I didn't try that. Of course I try that. <laughs> like, you know, I tried moving my watch back. I tried like everything I tried. I could not bench lift on time. And, you know, I'm part of this chat. Someone was sick. Let's try to bring in Shabbos five minutes early. I, 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 I just couldn't do it, you know. Um, and then October 7th happened. And I was listening to, um, I don't know who it was, somebody that said, you know, take something upon yourself that will really be a struggle for you. And that is going to be your, what you're working on so hard. And that should be a schos for, you know, the hostages and the, the soldiers. And um, like, I have a friend, she stopped eating um, cake and cookies since October 7th, she said, because she just loved it so much. And she knew that that for her would be a big thing. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who stopped you know, slurpees, you know, the small things that whatever. And I said, because I listened to the shir and she spoke about how Shabbos protected so many people from the attack, you know, people that became from and were keeping Shabbos, people that, you know, like whole Shavim that were protected. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to take upon myself to bring in Shabbos 10 minutes early. Mm -hmm. And this was October 7th. So we're going into the winter months, you know, um, Shabbos was like, for something early, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm really proud to say that I did it. I've wow. been lighting, um, 10 minutes early since October 7th. Um, one time, I mean, as Shabbos got later, I started getting confused because then we start bringing Shabbos early, like at seven, does that mean I have to light 10 minutes to seven, uh -huh. you know? And then someone clarified, they're like, no, bringing in Shabbos early is early. Like you're like now 40 minutes early. Right, you're like, right. I was in Eretz Yisrael, um, recently and we, they were bringing in Shabbos and I freaked out because we were staying in an apartment and we had to walk like a million miles and I couldn't get the key to work. And I came panting down to like bench lift and I was, I was like crying because I thought I had missed it. But apparently I was way more okay because they bench lift 40 minutes early oh, okay. in Yerushalayim. Yeah, okay. So I was like 22 minutes early, you know? Right. Um, but yeah. And, and interestingly enough, like on this journey with me to bench lift early, a lot of women have joined me. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought it was just me. Like everyone else can bench lift on time. Everyone else can bring in Shabbos five minutes early. There's something wrong with my brain. And so many people reached out to me afterwards and were like, you know what? You posted that you struggled with this and you were taking this upon yourself. And it made me feel like, oh, I'm not crazy. Like she also, you know, yeah. and I have all these women that like, after I post like bench 10 minutes early, they'll, they'll text me like me too. And thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for being so honest and open about it. Cause all we really see are all the women that are like, oh, my Shabbos table is set, you know, Thursday night. And I was sitting and saying to Hillam 10 minutes before I benching left, you know? And so, um, so that was something I took by and I'm very proud of it. That's and, really beautiful. Yeah, yeah we can't relate. We, we think in shops at 9 a.m. It's very easy for us. We don't understand <laughs> shop. No, it's a struggle in, in our house also. Uh, hopefully my wife doesn't throw me on the bus for that. But no, I, I, I think it's, it's such a good point that with this or really with anything, I, I think anytime someone has a struggle, we often think like, I'm the only human being. And like you look out on Instagram or you just look outside, everyone seems to have everything all together yep. while everyone's thinking like, how does everyone else have it together while yep. I'm trying to figure out? Yep. So it's a very good point. This is like very eye-opening for me because right. so many people, you know, 
like reached out to me and were right. like, thank you so much for saying that you struggle with this. And, you know, I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, that's that's very powerful. And yeah, I encourage anyone listening if they want to take on 10 minutes early. Um, they could do if you could do it, anyone could do it. Trust me, if <laughs> I could do it, anyone could do it. I yeah. mean, I really I don't think I even bench lift on time. I mean, now I'm doing it early, but before October 7th. Wow. And that's saying a lot because wow. I've been married for a long time and I've been <laughs> benching lift for many, many years. And honestly, I, I don't even know. I'll tell you what I learned. What I did learn is to let go of the small things, you mm -hmm. know, like sometimes they'll be like, oh, let me just throw in that extra pan of brownies, you know, and I'll have to, okay, Devara, you don't need that extra right. pan of brownies. No one will care if you don't make that. Everyone will survive. Right. Don't start making brownies now right. 40 minutes before Shabbos. Right. You, you have know? it all together already. Uh, as you know, we ask if there's one person from history or someone who's no longer with us, if you could spend an hour with, who would it be? So many people. <laughs> but um, if I had to narrow it down, I would say Sara Imeno. Sorry. Because my mm. name is Devora Bas Sara Imeno. Mm. Um, and she is my mother. Mm. And um, I really feel that I would love to meet her and just talk to her. And, you know, she is the mother of all mothers. Yeah. And um, it's interesting because one year uh, when I went back to Eretz Yisrael, I went to Mars Machpelah. Interestingly enough, I had lived in Eretz Yisrael for many, many years. We moved to America, uh, I think about 25, 26 years ago. Um, I had my first five children in Eretz Yisrael, and then I had two here. And teaching fifth grade, we teach Navi. And I would always tell them little tidbits about, you know, oh, you know, I once went kayaking down the Eureka River. Or, you know, I would tell them like little bits of whatever we were learning to like make it more, you know, tangible to them. Like this is a real place. Like Eretz Yisrael is a real, you know, and... Um, one time we were learning Parsha and they said something about, you know, Mrs. Goldstein, you never talked to us about Maris Machpela. And I was like, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I've never been to Maris Machpela. And they're like, what? <laughs> You've never been to Maris Machpela? And I said, no, because I think like when I was in seminary, like it wasn't safe, you know, it wasn't like any any place I've ever like gone. Mm. Um, so I went to Eretz that year. I, I would go back every year to visit my family. And I was like, okay, I have to go to Maris, Maris Machpelah. I can't tell my kids that, you know, every, about, you know, like Kevin Rachel and then, and then not have anything to say about Maris Machpelah. So I went with my um, daughter. I think it was the year I went to go visit her in seminary. So my older daughter. And um, we went to Maris Machpelah. We went on some tour and um, in an armored bus and we went all around and then we got to Maris Machpelah and he said, okay, we're going to let you daven. And I chose to daven Mincha by Sarah Imenus Kever. Um, it was very interesting. There was actually a brisk going on in front of Avram Avinu's cover, which mm. I thought was like, like so cool, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I opened up my sitter and I started to daven. And all of a sudden, I know this is going to sound so weird, and I'm not like a heebie-jeebie type of person. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I felt like this warm, you know, like sometimes when you open up a door and there's like heat and like, yeah. and then like this warm air comes to you. Mm. So like all of a sudden I felt this warm air just like sort of going around me. And I just started to cry like mm. this, this crying from like my neshama. Like, I don't think I've ever cried like that before. It was like this crying that started like from deep within. And I was like shaking and I just had tears pouring out on my face. And I was just like davening. I was like, you know, sorry, you're my mother, you're, you know, and I just felt this like warmth about, you know, and I finished davening and, you know, I looked up for my sitter and my daughter was just standing there staring at me. <laughs> And she was like, Ma, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. She's like, Ma, you were literally shaking and you were crying so hard. You were like, it was like a silent type of crying. You were just like, but I felt so light. Like I felt mm -hmm. like I felt cleansed. Not that I had to be cleansed of anything, mm -hmm. but I just felt like I felt like I had been given a big hug wow. you know, from Sarah. And it was really incredible. So I would love to meet her because in essence, that's my name, Devara Basari Menu. Wow. Okay, that is a very powerful story. Is there a story that happened to you in your life or that you heard in your life that gives you chizek or strength? So many. We have another couple of hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if a story per se. Um, I could just share two things with you. I I get tremendous, tremendous chizek from the people in Eretz Yisrael. Um, you know, the mothers of the soldiers, um, they're, they're unbelievable people. The wives, you know, I just, I, I have no words for it. You know, I, a year ago, I would have said something different, but unfortunately mm. this year, it's so, you know, it's so close to our, 
our hearts. And I know that, you know, sometimes people will say to me, Devorah, like, you know, this happened so long ago, like, you know, like, like you got to get back into the world, you know? And I'm like, I am in the world, but I also have one foot in there. So like mm-hmm. my heart is there probably because I grew up there, you know, um, you know, I know some of the soldiers that were killed, they were family friends. And I just, I look at these mothers every time they're interviewed and, you know, like I think Mrs. Goldberg, you know, also, you know, the tremendous bitachon and amuna that they have, that a Kaddish Baruch Hu is, is running the world and that their child, their son, you know, is, is defending Eretz Yisrael. They were, they were, you know, they raised them to do this. They sent them to the army knowing that this could happen. And I just, you know, I'm just, I'm in awe because I don't know if I would be strong enough to do something like that. You know, I just, it just, the stories that I hear that come out from there are just unbelievable stories like Hadass. Um, Low concern, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the stories that she told of her husband, yeah. and, you know, were just, Really, they really stayed with me for a very long time. Um, and someone that like actually inspired me was a woman from Baltimore. Um, and her name, um, of course, I'm having a senior moment now. It's her last bad. name was Gutman. Okay. Lori, Lori Gutman. Um, and she she was a very special woman in Baltimore. Um, she started the Beaker Cholam. She helped start the mikvah. Um, and unfortunately, she got sick and she passed away. When I was at her Leviah, I remember her son got up and said this, and it struck me so much that it's like, I want to make it into a bumper sticker. Hmm. And he said at the end of his mother's illness, when she was in a lot of pain and, you know, it was hard and it was difficult, you know, she looked up at her children and she said, I hope that when I get to Shemayim, that Hashem is as happy with me as I am with him hmm. for everything that he's given me, for everything that I have. And that really just struck with me. Like, you know, I hope that Hashem is as happy with me as I am with him because I am so grateful for everything that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has given me, my husband, my children, my friends, my in-law children, my grandchildren. And, you know, if you think if you think about it, like, you know, sometimes when I speak, I I show like a, um, a slideshow, just, you know, a little bit about my childhood and as my family became from her. And, um, and we always end it with what I think is like a very powerful picture. It's a picture of my mother and father, not from, holding me as a baby, you know, between the two of them. My father has like long hippie hair. Yeah. You know, my mother is like dressed like a, you know, her long hair hippie, you know, right. like. And um, the picture kind of like explodes to my most recent family picture of myself with all my married children and my mm. grandchildren. And it Yoni just, Guggenheim. it's a very, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know Yoni Guggenheim. Shout out to Yoni Guggenheim, my son-in-law. That's my great. favorite, amazing son-in-law. <laughs> my, my only son-in-law right now, but. Um, so yeah, yeah. They, sorry, interrupting yeah. like a very serious <laughs> moment. No, so it's very beautiful. It starts off with your parents and you, and then to your Baruch Hashem expanding right. family. And I, I, like, I think to myself, and a lot of times, like people will come and tell me that, like, they're inspired by the fact that, like, by that one act of my father picking me up mm. on a bench, you know, um, in China, in Taiwan, you know, led to not only him having four sons that are, you know, raising Torah homes and Torah families. Um, I have a brother that lives in Haifa. I have a brother that lives in Rechassim. I have two brothers that live in Beit Shemesh. Um, and, you know, tons of grandchildren and great-grandchildren that are living Torah lives and learning in yeshiva. But that I, this little tiny, you know, Chinese baby, you know, was raising a home, Baruch Hashem, filled with Torah and, you know, children and grandchildren. And, you know, hopefully, Merz Hashem, more generations to come. Amen. Beautiful. So, yeah. Okay, I want to end off with with advice, what advice would you give? Either you could choose who you're talking to, either to your, let's say 14 year old self or the, the, the point in your life when you were getting bullied and you weren't having an easy time, what what advice would you give to you or to anyone, someone, someone watching or listening to this, whether they're getting billy, bullied or like they're having a hard time fitting in, in in whatever context that means, what advice would you give? Probably the best advice I would give to myself or anybody is, twofold. It's one that Hashem loves you and don't forget it. And it's hard. It's hard to always think that Hashem is, you know, thinking of me, loving me, taking care of me. So many things happen. And sometimes you could be like, Hashem, hello. Like, (laughs) why did you just do that? Or why did that just happen? But, um, you know, my father, Alva Shalom, um, as I said, Alva Shalom, he was, he was Nifter, unfortunately. Um, his yard site's coming up this LL, um, Zion LL, I believe will be 16 years, if I'm not mistaken. And um, he was diagnosed with a level four glioblastoma, a brain tumor in his head. And nobody survives this. Some people could survive months, days, weeks, even maybe years, but nobody is a survivor that can say, you know, I had this 15 years ago and I'm a survivor. It's a known fact that 
everyone unfortunately dies from it. And um, I think one of the reasons is because it's found so, 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 so late that by the time it's found, it is a level four. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents had actually come to America for my third son of Rami's bar mitzvah. And everybody loved to hear my father speak. Like my friends would be like, when your father speaks at like the Suda, can we just come here? Like, you know, they would just love, he just had a very unique way of speaking and reaching out to people. And he also loved to drink. He was a big drinker. Like we knew when Zadie was coming, it's time to go and buy the schnapps, you know, mm -hmm. the black label, the this, the that, the Crown Royal, you know. Um, and he loved to drink, but he was always able to hold it like very well. Like we never, he was never drunk. I don't think I ever saw my father drunk. I never saw, you know, he just liked that little, you know, after the meal mm -hmm. um, drink. And he got up to speak at my son's bar mitzvah and he was like all over the place. Like he was not making any sense. He started with like a Devar Torah. Then he gave a bracha to my son that he should find a girl to marry as wonderful as my mother, which sound, but it just wasn't fitting in. You know, it was just very, and then he gave a bracha to all the chayalim and Eretz Yisrael. They should all be protected. I mean, there was no war going on at the time. And what, you know, it was just very, it was just like all over the place. And my husband and I were like, oh my gosh, he's drunk. Like he, he find he's getting older. Like, you know, he can't hold the liquor like he used to be able to. He's, he's drunk. And so we, you know, gently took him down. Um, from the stage and, um, you know, continue with the meal, whatever. And he was also very tired. He was sleeping a lot. And then they went back to Eretz Yisrael. And a couple of days later, my mother called me and said that she saw that my father was acting very like erratically and doing like really strange things. And um, she took him to the doctor and the doctor, I mean, I don't know how all the events played out then, but basically they saw something in his brain and they weren't sure if it was a tumor or maybe something else. And so, um, you know, my mother said, just Davin. And from there, everything just kind of snowballed. Um, I have an amazing, amazing husband. Um, my father was slated for surgery over, um, I think the first day, this first day of Cholomite of Sukkot. And um, he was actually diagnosed with the tumor, uh, Mutsu Yom Kippur. So my husband put me on a plane with two of my boys and we flew to Eretz Yisrael so I could be there for my father's um, surgery. My husband took my other kids and went to a really good friend of ours in Brooklyn mm -hmm. where she hosted my husband and my kids for the whole circus. And um, I was there when my father was, you know, having his surgery. And I just remember like feeling like, whoa, like this is crazy, you know? And my mother told me that we shouldn't tell anybody exactly what it was because in order to have like a complete refuo, it would have to be a nace. So he's like, you know, she's like, we could tell people that he's sick. We could tell people that he needs a refuo shlema to daven for him. But let's not say that it's like a level four glioblastoma in the brain. We're just going to say he's like, he really needs a refuo. So my father went in for the surgery and, um, you know, they did the surgery and something that happened that they said would like never, ever happen. So my mother didn't even sign off on it. It was so rare. They couldn't take him out of the um, anesthesia that he was put under. Every time he came out, he would go into major seizures. And like that obviously wasn't good for the delicate brain that had just gone through surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, and at one point, um, I believe it was Arif Hoshana Rabba, they told my mother that, that they were going to have to put him into such a deep medical coma, they weren't sure they could take him out of it. And my mother just, that night, Hoshana Rabba was just giving away tzedakah, you know, like emptying out the account, get, just giving it away, making gamatrias. And Baruch Hashem, he came out of it. Um, and we were told he would have five months to live. So Baruch Hashem throughout, I mean, this is a whole story in itself, but throughout his entire, you know, illness, we saw tremendous, tremendous brachos and Yat Hashem. Um, but I decided to fly back to Eretz Yisrael every month to see my father because I had a friend in Baltimore after I flew back after the surgery, um, who came to me and said, I just want to tell you that your father was my teacher in Neve. My father taught in Neve Yushlaim. And she said, my father actually passed away of something called, um, a glioblastoma of the brain, a level mm. four. And your father was very helpful to me during this time. And I just have a feeling that's what your father has. And I want to pay back. And she said, I wish someone had told me this because I would have like been so different when my father was sick. She goes, you need to go back to Eretz Yisrael every month to see your father. And she said, don't worry about the money. She said, take out a different credit card for every flight. You'll pay back the money eventually. You'll never get this time back with your father. She said, every month there's a change. Every month is different. You must go back. And I did. And I'm like forever grateful to her. I went back every single month. And of course I had people that were like, oh, it's so good that you're such a good daughter. You're also a wife and a mother and a teacher. How can you just pick up and leave your family? I'd go for like three days. I'd go for a Shabbos. Um, and I was just grateful because I, I, I was happy that I had that time. And one night, it was like very, very late at night. Um, I don't know if this happens to you or your wife. It could be a female thing. 
And about 11 o'clock at night, I start to get like giddy, meaning like I start to cry at things that are not so sad, you know, like Pampers commercials, you know, I'll be like, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful, you know? <laughs> or like, I start to laugh at things that are really like not so funny, you know, like some stupid knock knock joke, like Mike, and I'll be like, oh my God, that's hilarious. And I'll literally be laughing till tears come out of my eyes. It's something about that 11 o'clock changing right. of the clock. Yeah, yeah, I had the same thing. So um, it was 11 o'clock at night, one of these like, you know, I'm in the kitchen in Bayafagan with my mother um, and I'm talking to my mother and I look up at my mother and finally go, you know what, Ma? She said, what? I said, I'm angry at Hashem and I'm waiting. I'm waiting for her to either like smack me, <laughs> even though I'm a grown woman, you know, with children of my own, um, or like look at me in horror and be like, oh, you better do like 25 al chaits and you, you know, whatever. And like, you know, and take some kind of Kabbalah party. How could you say such a thing? Um, I think I mentioned to this in one of our previous comments. My mother's like a real tzaddikas. She's like just a very pure, good neshama, you know, yeah. that. Um, and so I was like, kind of like waiting to see her reaction. I did move back a little bit, you know, because <laughs> I was like, I don't know how she's going to react to this. And I waited to hear what she would say. And she looked at me and she just like smiled. And she said, oh, really? You're angry at Hashem? And she said, why? And I said, why? I'll tell you why. Because like, you know, this is something that happens to other people. Other people's fathers get sick. Other people's fathers get brain tumors. Other people's fathers are dying. Not my father. My father is the one who found me on a bench, wrote a book called The Bamboo Cradle, is trying to spread the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to people. He's been, you know, Makar of so many people. The story has spread all over. People recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu exists because of him. And this is how it ends. Like, he dies? So... What's the purpose? Like, why am I here? Why did the book happen? Why was I found? I'm, I'm angry. I'm angry at Hashem. Why are we going through this now? This is not supposed to happen. And my mother just smiled at me and she goes, you know what, Devairi, because that's what she calls me. It's so good that you're angry at Hashem. And I'm thinking like, whoa, <laughs> this is like not what I was expecting at all, you know? And she said, because if you're angry at Hashem, that means that you know it came from Hashem that this tumor did not just randomly appear in Taz's head, that if we had only checked his head, you know, for a tumor four months ago, we would have found something or we found it too late or we didn't do the proper treatments. Or if you're angry at Hashem, you recognize that this came from Hashem. And she said, that means that you know that everything in life is from Hashem. And he takes care of us and he loves us. And there might be things that he gives us that we're like, okay, I really wish you didn't give this to me. But you have to understand that Hashem is giving it to us it's for our own good and he loves us and he wants it for us and he knows that this is for us. And she said, you know, I look at Ta and I have to tell you, my parents were not, you know that expression, two peas in a pod? They were not two peas in a <laughs> pod. They were like that pea. <laughs> like my husband and I, we laugh all the time. We are complete opposites. My kids laugh all the time. They're like, like, what was Rivers and Shane thinking? Like the <laughs> two of you are like, you know, he loves to be outdoors. I hate to be outdoors, <laughs> you know? Like we're just complete opposites, you know? And Baruch Hashem, it works, but we're just really opposites. My parents were like that P. And she said, you know, I look at him and I say, thank you, Hashem, for giving me such an incredible zivug. Thank you, Hashem, for giving us you. You know, we didn't have any children. He gave us you. Thank you, Hashem, for giving us Yiddishkeit. We didn't have Yiddishkeit. And look how beautiful our life is now. Thank you, Hashem, for giving us the four boys that we got. Thank you for giving us the schus to live in Eretz Yisrael. Thank you that you are raising a from home and have children. And, you know, and, and my mother just kept on going on for all the brachos that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave her. And she said, if one thing is something that I'm not happy with, and this is not what I would have asked, I have to understand it's also from Hashem. And obviously this is part of his master big plan that we don't see. Mm. And so she said, I'm not angry at him. I'm sad, but I'm a Kabbalah. Mm. And I said, oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, and and I said, I, I guess I'm not angry anymore. I guess I'm <laughs> awesome a cobble. And, you know, my mother had a little book that she would write down every day, um, things that she was grateful to Hashem for. You know, I'm grateful today that the sun was out and I could wheel my husband out to the porch. I'm grateful today that the nurse came on time. I'm grateful today that, you know, the IV went in without any pain. I'm grateful today that, you know, he was able to swallow five swallows of whatever it was that, you know, mm -hmm. like small things every day, two things that she was grateful to Hashem for. And I tried that myself. Um, it's really hard mm -hmm. to like sit down and write down things that you're grateful to Hashem for that don't seem, you know, when I first started it, I started with, I'm grateful to Hashem for the invention of coffee. Thank you, Hashem, <laughs> for coffee. I'm grateful to Hashem for, you know, for my family. But like, she never repeated what she was grateful to Hashem for. And I found that 
I was writing the same things down. Like I'm grateful to Hashem for my husband. I'm grateful to Hashem for my children. I'm grateful to Hashem for my health. And then a week later, I'm grateful to Hashem for my family. I'm great, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to really take a step back and look and say, thank you, Hashem, for for everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and even today, everything that's going on in the world in Eretz Yisrael, obviously Hashem has a master plan. We don't understand it and we don't, we might not, you know, agree with it. We might say like, Hashem, just bring the hostages home already. Stop. Don't let the soldiers be killed anymore. Like enough, like, like enough, you know, you could do anything. You could split the sea. Like just, end this already. But obviously he has a master plan and it's okay to be angry at Hashem. It's okay to say to Hashem, Hashem, I'm angry that, you know, like the Bebus children are still hostage. I'm angry that Hirsch is not home with his family. I'm, you know, I'm angry that people are dying and are sick and that people aren't getting Shaduchim and I'm angry, but it's okay because I understand that it's coming from Hashem mm. and that at the right time, Hashem will send the Rafua and the Yeshua and the Bracha. Okay. He like lived for 10 months. Um, he was able to walk my brother down to the Chuppah. We were told that he would never walk again. And, you know, my brother got engaged and got married wow. during that time. It was like just like crazy, you know, things that we saw. But, um, and we just have to continuously love him and understand that he has our best interests at heart. And that's the advice I would give to anybody, to myself. I have to give it to myself a lot, <laughs> but yeah. That's really great advice. Devora, thank you so much for, for doing this. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm glad it worked out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for watching this week's riveting story. If you got this far, please leave in the comments the word wonderful. And by the way, Mora Devora is a great speaker. So in the show notes, you could definitely reach out to her and get her to come to your community. This episode is brought to you by Bitbean, the best software company, Tulery, the makers of the coolest clothing, I hope you get the pun, paid the ultimate way to cash in on your points. And of course, Chesed Chicago, the best way to help Chicago people in need and win a Tesla. And if you have not yet subscribed to our channel or podcast, please go ahead so you can see our latest content. And we have some really good episodes coming up. Two Jewish parents with hearts full of love adopted a little Chinese baby, unknowingly setting in motion a chain of blessings that would span generations. This single act of kindness brought them closer to God, deepening their faith and filling their lives with unparalleled joy. The baby grew up surrounded by love and now she's a mother and a grandmother and she continues to spread that joy, enriching countless lives. This story reminds us that one selfless act can ripple through time, transforming not just one life, but the lives of many across generations. Remember, inspiration is everywhere. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.